Hello, YouTube. Hello, Facebook. I am back and so happy to be here. Um, my name is James Baker, CPA. My CPA is not really a name. It's just a license, a designation that I have. And uh, that's the name of the channel. So I think you understand who I am and why I'm here. And if you're a subscriber, I appreciate you being here. I haven't been doing as many lives as before because I've been in the middle of tax season. All of the, if you have a U.S. company, all of the annual reporting is due in March and April of the next year. So right now we're doing the tax forms for all of our clients that have LLCs, multi-member LLCs, or live or work in the U.S., have corporations, all that stuff. We're um, filing the returns and doing the extensions and doing all of that stuff. So we've been very busy. Um, but I wanted to jump on and do a live with you today and answer some of the questions I've been getting. And then if you guys are on here, if, if I have any people on live watching, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat. I'm definitely, uh, you know, here to answer questions. I'm going to go on the Spanish channel later and answer any questions that come up in Spanish later. But right now, if you have any questions that you want to ask, um, feel free to ask. And I'm going to go through them on my own. Uh, I'll go through some of the questions that I already have written from that I've been asked during the week um, on my own here. So, you know, let me know. Uh, international tax, international business, if you're expanding to the U.S., um, if you have clients in the U.S., if you're getting U.S. tax forms, if you want to open a business in the U.S., if you want to invest in the U.S., all of those things are topics I can help you with for sure. Uh, so if you have questions, let me know. And the first thing I wanted to start off with was a question that my team was asking me. Um, the difference between U.S. taxpayers and people who aren't paying taxes in the U.S. And who, who basically the question comes down to this. Who has to pay taxes in the U.S.? And the U.S. tax system is split up into two different um, categories. And it's, all, and it's all really based on where the work is done. So you have to pay taxes on in the U.S. if you earn income in the U.S. or if you are a U.S. resident. So a U.S. resident is a green card holder or a citizen or a corporation. And if you're none of those, then you don't have to pay tax in the U.S. unless you have income earned in the U.S. And that would be like traveling to the U.S. to perform a service. If you're selling goods to people who live in the U.S., that doesn't count as earning income in the U.S. It might be U.S. source, but it doesn't mean you're doing business in the U.S., which is a, a really important distinction. So let me go through some of my questions. Again, if you guys have questions, I see some people jumping in and out. If you guys have questions, definitely type them here. I'm happy to answer. And um, I'm going to go through some of my questions. So a non-U.S. resident is asking, can I have an S corporation instead of an LLC? I read that since 2018, you can own it, do that indirectly via owning a trust first, and the trust owns the S corp. How hard is it to achieve such result? So... The, the question is really, can a non-resident own an S corporation? And the answer is no. An S corporation can only be owned by U.S. residents and generally U.S. persons. If we search on the IRS website, who can own a, a, an S corporation? It may be owned by individuals, either U.S. citizens or U.S. residents, but not non-residents and certain trusts and estates, but not by business entities such as C corporations and partnerships. So the only kind of trusts and estates are going to be grantor trusts, which are owned by U.S. residents. So generally, if you're not a U.S. resident, you can't have an S-Corp. And an S-Corp has passed through taxation like a multi-member LLC, like a partnership, except there's there's different distinctions and, and important things that really only matter to U.S. residents. If you are a U.S. resident, an S-Corp might be a great idea for you, generally for a services business or a, an active business. For investing, uh, for investments, it's not generally the best option. So I'm going to go through here. So uh, here's, a, here's another question I got. Follow up. I'm doing online arbitrage in Amazon FBA business model. Do I need an ITIN if I don't receive payments through PayPal or Stripe? Would I need a business PayPal to make payments? I would I need a business PayPal to make payments though? Okay. So th the question here is, do I really need an ITIN is the question. And you don't need an ITIN if you aren't 
Okay, the question is, let me re let me restart. Do I really need an I-10? And you don't need an I-10 unless you need to pay taxes in the U.S. Technically, an I-10 is a U.S. individual taxpayer identification number, I-10. And that's for a person, an individual, who has to file in a tax return in the U.S. and pay taxes. So if you're having taxes withheld from a payment, for example, if you're selling real estate and there's FERPA withholdings, it's helpful to have an I-10. Or if you are... Um, you know, having getting paid a wage for work done in the U.S., or maybe you have some other payment you're getting paid, and you need, and 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 the person paying you is withholding taxes because it is a U.S. It's subject to U.S. withholdings. Then it's helpful to have an ITIN. But generally, you don't need an ITIN. You don't need an ITIN to open a bank account. You don't need an ITIN to open a payment processor. You don't need an ITIN to open a brokerage account. You need an ITIN. Generally, PayPal is requiring you to have an ITIN, uh, but that's the only payment processor, the only service that is going to really need you to have an ITIN. So if you don't, if you don't need PayPal, you don't need an ITIN. And to get an ITIN, you have to file a form 1040 NR generally with a W-7 form attached to it with a copy of your passport, a certified copy of your passport, or you have to work with a certified acceptance agent. It's one of the more complicated nuanced forms and it takes a long time to get processed and it's uh you know it's kind of annoying and it, it annoys me that there's so many people out here selling the item like you need an item to open a bank account you need an item for this or for that and the truth is you don't and i and even though i do sell i can provide the service of getting you an item i include it with a, a lot of my packages and i and i help a lot of clients get it I definitely don't push it as something you need. I don't lie to people and tell them you need it for a bank account because the truth is you really don't. Maybe you go to a bank and they say, hey, you need to have an ITIN to open the account. Maybe some say that, but the banks in the U.S. are a mess. If you're in person at a bank, they're going to they're gonna give you a different answer every single time. So I'm telling you, you don't need it. And I've been helping clients with this kind of stuff for a long time. Um Hey guys, what's up, Muhammad? What's up, Miriam? If you guys have questions, you can send them here. I'm happy to answer them here. I don't have, I don't, it's like, I'm not on the Facebook that much, to be honest with you. I'm uh, checking the YouTube comments as much as I can, check email as much as I do my best. But if you have a Facebook message or something you want answered here, drop the question here. I'm happy to answer your question. Appreciate you guys being here. Oh, uh, here's a good question. I um, here, I'm going to summarize the question. It says, "I'm what structure do you advise the Amazon sellers to choose when creating an LLC for purpose of Amazon FBA?" Um, all a person in the field would not be changed, and Amazon insurance companies won't work around this. Okay, so the the que here here's like the title, right? How can foreign Amazon, how should, how should foreign Amazon sellers set up their businesses in the U.S. with an LLC, a corporation, a multi-member LLC? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit because it's a complicated topic. I work with a lot of people who have Amazon stores, who have LLCs, and there's, there's like three big distinctions here. With a single member LLC, one owner, the Amazon store info is going to have the owner's tax information on the, on the store. A lot of people don't like that. If you have a if you have a multi-member LLC, it should just have the U.S. company info in the store because it technically is a U.S. taxpayer. That's generally what I'm going to advise my clients to do as a multi-member LLC, just because when you're registering for the Amazon store, they're going to have the U.S. tax information, and it's going to be a little more clear, a little, um, and it's not going to have your personal info on the Amazon store for Amazon to be. Um, I don't know if they publicize it or how they do it. Um, and then the other option is a C corporation, which I don't like because you have to pay tax in the U.S. on this. For the first two options, the LLC with one owner or two owners, as long as you're using an FBA or fulfillment service, you wouldn't have a U.S. trader business. And that's technically and currently how the laws are being interpreted and how the laws are being enforced. Uh, it, it's so that you, if you have a U.S. Um, e-commerce account and you're selling on Amazon, you don't have to pay taxes on your profits. You can leave the money in your LLC. You can split it between different LLCs. You can do whatever you want, but you don't have to pay taxes on it. So um, the, the disregarded entity has 0% tax. And also the multi-member LLC, which files tax returns as a partnership, is also 0% taxation. 
However, it might be easier to set up and it's also going to be a little more clear on the back end of the Amazon um, of the Amazon forms, right? So uh, Amazon is going to come through and it's going to see that you show that you have um, uh, the, the company is registered and it's not the people registered. Uh, and the last part of this is that the insurance companies won't work with a, a disregarded entity. I think you can get insurance with a multi-member LLC. Uh, and I know that the insurance is now required. And that's something that I'd love to get an affiliate for. If any, anyone watching this is using an insurance company that you really liked for your single or multi-member foreign owned LLC, um, definitely share the link to that so that we can all, we can, you know, get insurance that we need to sell because it's really important to have that. But I think that's that's like kind of my answer for it. Uh, doing the tax um, the tax forms with Amazon aren't super crazy, but they are um, they do need to be done. Oh, I forgot. I'm just I'm just going live on YouTube. I guess no Instagram. I kind of do want to go live on Instagram too. But let me let me. Um, if you guys have any questions, put some questions in the chat. I'd love to answer your questions. Okay, let's go back to comments. Okay. Oh, here's a great question. Uh, how am I going to reword this? The question is going to be, what happens when an LLC has one U.S. owner and one foreign owner? What happens? What does this mean? And I've been getting this question a lot when there's uh, potentially uh, one of the owners of the LLC lives and works in the U.S. and the other one lives and works abroad. There's different ways to look at this. Um, and there's different interpretations that you can take um, when, you, when you, can, you can set your company up for when making a tax, but taking a tax position. Generally speaking, if you have a, ta a resident partner in the U.S., you have a U.S. trader business. And then any profits attributable to the foreign partner. So if you're 50, 50 and you make $2 million, $1 million of profits goes to the foreign partner. That means that technically if that partner is an individual, the, the U S multi-member LLC should withhold $370,000 of taxes to which the foreign partner would file a tax return with his ITIN, uh, a form 1040 NR, and then pay tax on his, uh, on his, um, on, on the actual calculated tax using the progressive tax rates. So that would that's what technically happens when there's a multi-member LLC with one partner in the US and one partner abroad. It's um it is a, a it is a little nuanced, it is a little tricky. And and sometimes I get clients that have questions where the the partner is outside of the US. For example, it's a US citizen, but he lives outside of the US. If he's still a partner, then he has to pay tax on his portion of the income in the U.S. because U.S. citizens pay tax on the worldwide income. However, the U.S. partnership wouldn't have to withhold the tax on the income attributable to the foreign partner because it wouldn't have a U.S. source income. Even though it's a U.S. partner, he there would be no U.S. trader business because the, the American doesn't live in the U.S. That's really the difference there. Oh, here's a question we have from the chat. In California, a single member LLC is owned by a C Corp and filed a com combined tax return. Does the single member LLC still need to file its own CA 568? I think it does. If it's a um, Guys, California. I'm looking at the answer. Um, 
yeah, form 568. <laughs> Do I have to file a form 568 for my California LLC? So form 568 must be filed by every LLC that is not taxable as a corporation if any of the following apply. The LLC is doing business in California. The LLC is organized in California. Or the LLC is organized in another state or country, but registered with the California Secretary of State. So if you the single member LLC is owned by a C Corp, um, if it if if the LLC is doing business in California or organized in California or organized in another state and registered in California, then yes, you still have to file the form 568 for that LLC, which is a big reason that I don't recommend California LLCs. You have to pay an extra eight hundred dollars and file another tax form where it's requesting financial statements and all kinds of information. It's quite annoying, um, to be honest. So yes, you still have to you still have to file that form. It looks like I mean that's on the California.gov ca.gov website and um yeah okay i have another question i want to go into if you guys again have questions anyone on here watching ask me your questions um what are the implications of having no what are the tax implications of having a u.s based bank account as a non-us resident business owner so if you're a non-resident and you have a U.S. bank account, that's great. Good for you. You have a, another way to get money. You can have money. You can have U.S. dollars. It's easier to get paid by American clients. There's a lot of benefits for having a U.S.-based account. But what are the potential tax implications is the question. So first, you need to review your home country. So what are the tax implications of wherever you're living for having a U.S. bank account? I don't know the answer to that question, but that is something you need to look into. So if you are in South America, if you're in Argentina, if you're in Colombia, if you're in uh, Ecuador, or whatever, there's there's some sometimes there's reciprocal agreements. Argentina, for example, just signed a new agreement where if the IRS is receiving forms for resident Argentinians, like income tax forms, they're going to share them with the government of Argentina. So potential potential tax implications of having a bank account is that if you earn interest more than twenty dollars and a form is sent to the IRS, potentially they could share that with Argentina, which is why generally I recommend using business bank accounts instead of personal bank accounts. I didn't delineate in my in my uh, opening description between personal or or business. I just said US-based accounts. But if you have um, business personal accounts and there's interest income, it could potentially be shared with your home country. Um, business accounts are a little bit more nuanced. They're not a little bit. They're a lot more nuanced. And something really important is that the banks in the US don't report everything to the U.S. government, only income information. They don't report when there's no accounts. They don't report when accounts are closed. They're really just reporting um, tax forms when there's in income earned by one of their clients as required. Like interest income generally is like what you would, <laughs> the income you'd earn from a bank account. Brokerage accounts are different. Um, other than that, in the U.S., it's been it's been uh, discussed in court cases, and uh, because what happens is sometimes the IRS will challenge a taxpayer uh, for their position, and then the taxpayer can take them to the IRS to court and challenge their position, and and they're fighting, and then the 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 courts have to decide who's right and wrong, and the courts have gone through it in different instances and decided, and kind of not decided, they've ruled that having a bank account on its own does not constitute having a U.S. trade or business, so. Just having a U.S. bank account doesn't mean you have to pay taxes in the, in the U.S. So the tax implications aren't huge in the U.S., but what you do need to review is whether or not you're getting generating income from these accounts and if that's causing information to be shared with your home country, which is something that, uh, you know, generally isn't, isn't a good thing, uh, especially if you're not reporting everything in your home country. We don't like to over-report stuff. I enter my mushroom mind. Okay. Um, let me see. Any more questions? Let me go. We have some comments here. Okay, Mohammed, that was kind of my first question. I'll go over it again. Oh, that's a good question, BV. St stick around. I'm going to answer your question too. Um, Mohammed says, If I open an Amazon business, do I have to pay taxes in the U.S. even though I'm a, a non-resident and I don't have stuff in the U.S.? Well, right now, Amazon having an Amazon business doesn't mean you need to pay taxes in the U.S. They're not going to withhold taxes on your payments, and they're not going to make you sign a W-8 ECI, which Walmart was making people sign. So 
you can use an FBA account and uh, you can use either Amazon FBA or another fulfillment center if you're doing different type of e-commerce and not actually be subject to U.S. income taxes. And that's because these fulfillment centers are not your employees. They're not they don't work for you. They work for hundreds and thousands of other companies and they are independent agents doing their own business. So you are just a regular guy outside of the U.S. who has this company who is basically creating goods or sourcing goods from one place and then selling them to people in the US. You are probably going to be subject to sales taxes, but Amazon is going to collect and remit those on your behalf. You don't really have to do much about the sales taxes, but regarding the income taxes, you're earning your income where you are sitting in your chair. So if you're sitting in your chair, you're earning your income where you live. And generally that's where you're going to pay tax. And this is something that's uh, obviously the internet is, 20 years old, right? 30 years old. It's still new. The tax laws don't change quick. And uh, these are still the laws that are applying right now. So you don't have to pay income taxes. There are compliance things you have to do. Sales taxes do apply, but Amazon does most of that for you. So you don't have to pay federal income tax. So there's no, there's nothing, no, no problem there. If you move to the U S if you open a store, if you open a retail store or an office in the U S then, um, then you might have to this other stuff to review. It's when it's it's all about where you're physically doing the work. Hello, Nain. Please um, message me. Um, I'll, I'll I'll make sure we reach out to you. You're a client and you have a question and no one's answering. That we got to get back on that. Um, so let me see if I can. Um, can I play private message you? No. All right, thanks. Usually the team is pretty quickly on answering emails. It should be within a day. Um, we have the we have some time for the tax filing. Um, and I'm excited to be working with you. So, okay, so next we have BV. Let's go to BV. And uh, um, and Danny, make, uh, have uh, sh share the message from, from Nain on here and make sure that uh, our team's caught up on the emails. And uh, if you have an email, if you have something for our team, support at jamesbakercpa.com. Uh, I put it in the in the chat right here so you can see. Send us an email. And i um, happy to uh, make sure that we respond right away. Okay, BV. Hi, James. If a single owner of S-Corp renounces citizenship. Okay, perfect. So what happens if an S-Corp owner renounces citizenship? What happens to the S Corp? So do you need the uh, revocation letter or does it terminate itself? So the S Corp is ineligible to become an S Corp uh, and, and, and it's ineligible to be an S Corp still. So it, the, the, the election would be terminated automatically. We still would file a final return and indicate that it's final, but because it doesn't qualify to be an S Corp, it would just lose the S Corp status. You don't need the revocation letter. So, um, I've done the revocation letters and it's kind of like, it's really co pretty confusing to be honest. But if you just leave and renounce your ownership, then it, it ceases to be an S corp. We file a final return and I haven't really had issues from the IRS about doing this because at the end of the day, if you're not, if you're not a U.S. taxpayer and you're not a U.S. resident, you don't qualify to have an S corp and the status would be, uh, it would default to whatever it is of their corporation or an LLC. So you don't need the letter. That's a good question though. Um, you need to, there's other stuff you have to file. You have to, uh, comply with code section 877, 887. I don't remember which one it was for the expat tax. If you've been a citizen for a long time, just to make sure that you don't have any, um, taxes due for expatriating. But that's, um, that's a different, you know, topic that is really complicated. Next question. Amazing. So digital agency. Okay, what happens? Um, it's it's basically I'm the question is Ma Mahmoud is from the UK. He has a Wyoming LLC, and the question is, how do I bring money from my LLC to the UK, or how do I spend my money from the UK, or what are the tax implications? Okay, I'm gonna restate this because I'm trying. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, give me a second. Okay. So this is a good question, Mahmoud. I want to I want to answer this for you. 
Oh, I don't need to share it. What are the tax implications for a single member LLC owned by a UK resident? The tax implications in the US are all about if you're doing business in the US or you have US uh, income. So if you're a digital agency working from the UK, the laws are quite nuanced. I've actually talked to, I did a, an interview, an expert interview with uh, one of my colleagues who's a UK tax advisor who I refer my clients in the UK to. I don't know if those snippets are coming up or if the whole conversation is coming up. We filmed it like a week ago. Um, but we went over like how LLCs are taxed when they're owned by UK residents or non-residents of the UK. So it depends on where you live. Um, you pay taxes. And, and, and then there's another ruling uh, that I've been I've been talking to different UK tax advisors that there's another ruling that where the LLC might not necessarily be treated as a pass through entity. But at the end of the day, if you're living and working in the UK and you have an LLC, you're going to be subject to tax on the income you earn from your LLC in the UK. From my understanding of the tax laws there. I'm not a UK tax expert and there might be ways if we get into a call with your UK tax expert and myself to find something that we can do to mitigate your taxes. For example, if you have a um, another like an offshore entity, another entity where you pay for services or some other way to get income out, then um, you know that might <laughs> that might be a solution. But generally, if you're living and working in the UK and you're using an LLC, you're still going to pay tax in the UK. It just might make sense to have it owned by a UK LTD instead of owned by you personally as the, the corporate tax rates are much lower than the, the personal tax rates in the UK. Um, thanks, man. Thanks for the uh, for the comment, Mohammed. I know I like to wear a tie for these if that's what you, uh, <laughs> that's what you mean. Let's see. We have uh, 10 people in here still. Let me know if you have other questions. Otherwise, I'm going to jump back into my... Uh, some pre-written questions so I can keep talking about this stuff. Oh, this is a good question. I um, Do I have to file a DR-15 even though I'm only selling on Amazon? And I love answering questions that I don't know the answer to off the bat because that way I can uh, be very vague and look up the answer with you. So in this, in this question, this person has a reseller certificate. So basically they, they registered for... Um, a reseller certificate in Florida so they can have the, the certificate and not pay sales taxes on their from their, their suppliers, right? And they're only selling on Amazon. So Amazon is actually submitting, uh, collecting and submitting all of the sales taxes on behalf of the, you, you know, the, the client, the person. Um, so how should you be filing the DR-15? using the Amazon report and will I be filing monthly or quarterly? So the DR15, they, they, they should tell you whether you file monthly or quarterly. Generally, it starts out quarterly. And um, if you're doing a lot, they might change it to monthly. So it starts out quarterly. And um, that's a great question. How should you be filling it out? Since Amazon is, is actually do, reporting the sales and collecting the taxes and remitting the taxes on the sales. I like to, I, I, I do report zero a lot for a lot of clients because you, you're kind of, all the sales are being reported by Amazon and they're, they're not really being, they're not really your sales. So I would probably report it as zero because you think about Amazon's filing a DR15, they say that they have 500,000 of sales and they're paying, they're collected 7% sales taxes and they submitted it all. If Amazon's reporting that, I don't think you should have to report it too. I have not, I'm not referencing the the law or the code, but at the end of the day, there should be no taxes for you to pay because Amazon's collecting and paying all of the taxes. So um, you have to see if you're filing monthly or quarterly. And then you have, I don't think you're going to, I think, I, I think I would file with zero uh, and just make sure you file them on time because Amazon should be filing everything. If you're filing, if you're selling also on your own website, then you might need to report those sales separately. So uh, I think there's a little bit of a room for interpretation here. I, I believe I emailed the state and didn't get a, a response back for this question because it is a good question. I didn't get a response back yet, but that's uh, that's my answer. That's my answer to Q5. Question five that I have here. What's up, Tony? What's 
uh, Mahmoud. I I was I had the expert interview with my friend. Uh, let me look up his email or his his firm. Um, hot links. Oh, great question, Jesus, my friend. Okay, I'm gonna find this UK advisor. I have his email here somewhere. Um, tell him I sent you, uh, or you know, send us both an email, whatever. Jesus has a question, and it's really, what's the benefit of using a Mercury account over a Wise account? So it's like Mercury or Wise. What is better? What are the benefits of having a real bank account? And the, the the huge benefit, and it's a real practical benefit, is that it's an actual bank account. It's a, which means that it's subject to banking regulations in the U.S. It's FDIC insured by the government. We're talking about Mercury here. And if uh, and, and here's the example: FTX, we all remember, just closed, and everyone lost all their money. If Wise gets hacked, if their server room explodes, everyone's money is all digital money it's all gone you're not getting it back you're getting no support you're getting no help who knows the the how how wise is taking care of their stuff but they don't have insurance if mercury explodes and again mercury is evolved bank and trust if mercury software breaks evolved bank and trust is technically the custodian of the money and they have fdsc insurance so if the bank closes down you can get up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars back from the u.s government uh, so that's a big deal. You don't want to just keep money in an account online that has no kind of insurance or backing. So uh, that's a big risk, you know. Having a wise business account is cool and you can hold money on there, but if it's the support's not as good, there's way there's more restrictions and it's just not a bank, you know. They can shut down and close anytime. So that's like the practical benefits of having that. Like I would have both. Wise is useful. Wise has multiple currencies. But the big difference is here, like I said, Mercury has debit cards. Mercury is an actual bank account and it has the FDIC insurance. And they're both they're both basically free to use. So have both of them. Um, they might be insured in the UK, but they don't they're not um, they're not they're not neo banks. They're both not like neo banks, like you said, like Wise is an EMI, an electronic money inter intermediary. Wise isn't I don't I don't believe Wise is FDIC insured. Uh, while Mercury Bank is a software built on top of Evolve Bank and Trust, which is a bank that's been around for 100 years, is WISE FDIC insured. So, yeah, um, banks, WISE, maybe maybe it is the FDIC insured. Let's see, WISE, no, that's a different bank, is TransferWISE FDIC Sure. Okay, so they said, uh, <laughs> hold on, I'm trying to, okay, we do differently, so why is it saying from, let's say, wise.com, is it safe to keep my money in, why is, why it isn't safe, I mean, I wouldn't keep all your money in one place, but um, Wise website says on is in on the Wise website. Is it safe to keep my money in a Wise account? They say Wise isn't a bank. We hold different regulatory permissions in various countries to enable us to provide our services to you. What's a financial protection scheme? So they have they have uh, financial protection schemes FSCSs to safeguard the money. So unlike unlike Wise, banks lend out money deposited by the consumers. If a large number of borrowers are unable to repay, then the bank could become insolvent. Um, this is why the government makes them insure their deposits with FDIC insurance or whatever. Um, Wise doesn't lend out customer money. Instead, they safeguard the money. What is safeguarding? And they have UK, they have EEA, customer funds, um, they have different regulations, but yeah, they're different. Wise isn't isn't insured, but they have financial protection schemes. So again, like while the banks are lending out your money, the uh, they have insurance at least, and the insurance is for you. So 
Um, Wise is a, is really a software built on top of a bank, and uh, no, no, Wise is an electronic monetary money intermediary and EMI, and there's other ones like AirWallX, and they're and they're useful tools, but they're not banks uh, like Mercury is or like Chase or Bank of America, where they're all the same kind of bank. Mercury and Chase and Bank of America and all of these different banks are still FDIC insured, and you know they all they're all kind of are good and bad in their own ways. That's a good question though. Um, let me see. What else do we have here? So I try interesting. Uh, I want to read that. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my questions here if you guys don't have questions. That's a good question, though. Great. Here's a question. When does a non-resident have to pay taxes in the U.S. when they're using an LLC? A non-resident has to pay taxes in the U.S. when they're using an LLC, when, when the owners come into the U.S. to provide services. That's one way. So let's say you come in and you you're selling, let's say you... Let's say your service is like uh, you fix canoes for a bit and you come into a place and you fix 500 canoes in person, you'd be subject to tax. Um, another one would be if you have a, a U.S. business. So let's say you open a physical store where people bring their canoes in, you pay tax uh, on, on your activities. Let's say another option would be you hire someone who performs services in the country. So you hire someone to fix the canoes on location. That's U.S. trader business. Uh, if you're shipping canoes into the country and, and selling them and just like shipping them direct to consumer, that's not a U.S. business. You're just selling to Americans and it's fine. Your business is really being done from your house online, wherever your wherever your real store is, which is from your home online. Uh, if you are selling instructional guides on how to um, fix a canoe, then if it's a if it's a book you're shipping to someone then you would pay sales tax because it's a physical book if it's a, a video course that you're selling someone on how to fix canoes then there's no sales taxes and there's no income taxes um how many more examples can i take out of fixing canoes here if you are <laughs> it's all about where you're doing the work so if you are teaching people how to use a canoe but you come into the us to teach them Technically, you're, you're subject to taxes. If you're making videos or training people on the phone or doing things remotely and showing them how to ride a canoe, then you're not subject to U.S. income taxes. It's all about where you're doing the work. And I hope my canoe example is helpful and uh, explains when you don't have to pay income taxes. And these are income taxes. Sales taxes are all about, and I'll talk about that in a second. I'll, talk about, I'll break that down in a second, actually. Okay, here's, here's another question I got. As a non-U.S. citizen operating an LLC in Wyoming and selling print-on-demand products, POD products on Etsy, where do I pay taxes? And am I engaged in U.S. trader business? Should I use my EIN or my VAT ID on tax setting on Etsy? Very interesting. So... This, this brings me first to the, the the VAT ID or the EIN setting. So if you have an LLC and you want to sell on Etsy, I think you need a, uh, a tax ID for the owner as well. Uh, you need an ITIN, I believe, to sell on Etsy with a single foreign-owned single-member LLC. So I go back to one of my first questions. I think you need an ITIN for that. I can confirm. I've helped other clients do this. But... Um, to sell on Etsy, I would use the LLC. And, and the difference, um, the VAT ID thing uh, from the question comes down to where you're selling to. If you're selling to um, people in the U.S., you would use a U.S. Um, US information. And if you're selling in Europe or other countries, that's when you need the VAT information. The U.S. has a sales tax. Foreign countries have a VAT tax, which is not a an income tax. It's a sales tax. It's based on how much you're selling and who you're selling to and where they're located at. So um, you wouldn't pay income taxes in the U.S. You pay income taxes based on where you're doing the work from, like where you live generally. And uh, that 
and this it says non-U.S. citizen. And I, I'm, I'm assuming you're operating the business outside of the U.S. as well. Um, so, yes, you should use your EIN. Uh, you might need a U.S. tax ID. I'm not sure. And you, you might have to try it out. And, um, yeah, the, the, the VAT number is only for when you're doing sales in Europe. Here's a question by Jesus. Oh, that's a tough one, Richard. Oh, if you have any other links, send me. Okay, so Jesus has a follow-up. He says, I've read that multi-member LLCs are historically less audited than single member. Well, that's that's contextually, I think you that's out of context. Um so the question is, what's the advantage of having a multi-member LLC and adding an owner over having a single member LLC? So the, and what are the disadvantages? So the advantages are that you can position yourself as a U.S. person by providing a form W-9 and putting the responsibility for withholding taxes on your own company instead of on the people that are paying you. This gives you a little bit more control and autonomy over which taxes you want to withhold and what taxes you want to pay and how you report everything, which is great. Um, your comment about the single member LLCs being more audited is a little out of context because whatever you read that from is probably in reference to U.S. taxpayers. So if I open an LLC, I'm filing it on my personal tax return. And that's, yeah, that is way more audited. But for a foreign person, you're filing a form 5472. And I've never seen an audit on one of those. So the context of who the owner of the single member LLC is, is very important because I believe that a, a foreign owned single member LLC filing a form 5472 has a much lower chance of being audited than a foreign owned multi-member LLC. Um, that said, I don't think, I think you have a very strong position in both situations. If you, in both scenarios, that if you're doing international business, you have no presence in the U S and nothing in the U S that you wouldn't be subject to U S income taxes. So I don't think it's a problem to be audited, but I think it is. I think that the 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 source or the citation you used here is a, is a little off because again, I, I imagine it's referencing U.S. Um, taxpayers. So to follow up on this, let's say this this person wants to register. Uh, you do the LLC, uh, multi member LLC again. The the big advantage is that you can position as a U.S. person and control your your destiny. The the disadvantage is that you're the re reporting is a little bit more involved. You have to say who the partners are, how much ownership they have. You have to report the financial statements, which is the profit and loss and um, the balance sheet. And depending on where you live, you might not want to disclose all of that. Whereas if you're a foreign owned single member LLC, the information you have to share with the US is a little bit different. It's only about related party transactions. So in, in order to do this, if you, um, if, and I, I'm sorry if I'm getting too technical. You can comment if you need more elaboration. But in order to have the, the take the advantage of the multi-member LLC, which are quite big, being able to position position as a U.S. Uh, taxpayer um, is great because then you can file a W-9 and avoid a lot of withholding on different forms. And all you really need to do is make sure someone owns at least, you know, 0.1% of the company. So there's more than one owner. So I think I answered the question because, I mean, he says, I mean, I'm, if I'm just adding a partner just for the sake of adding a partner and having a multi-member LLC instead of going for a single member by myself, I mean, if it depends. If you're doing Amazon, like I said earlier, it might be better to have the um, um, the multi-member LLC. I'm going to skip Juan's questions and go back to them. Oh, I have Richard's question. Oh, okay. I'll answer that too, Richard. Give me a second. Um as a quick follow-up, MD says, utilizing fulfillment centers don't count as businesses inside the U.S., the states, right? So um, the question is, does, if, if I use a fulfillment, does a fulfillment center cause me to have a U.S. trader business? And the answer is no. And the big example is Amazon FBA. But a fulfillment center is a business that is independent of your business and they're providing their own service and you're basically contracting them to do their job. 
And even though their job mm -hmm. requires managing some piece of physical inventory that used to be yours, they're taking control of that and they're managing all of that and you have nothing to do with it. And they're independent. They have many clients and they would definitely meet the definition of an independent agent. A dependent agent is a fulfillment center, which is your cousin who only has one client, which is you. Now that's not a fulfillment center. That's your cousin, you know? So if you have, if you're doing, Am if you're doing <laughs> e-commerce and you're just using your cousin as a fulfillment center, that could be a dependent agent. You might have, you have more risk in that example, but if you're using Amazon where they have thousands and thousands of clients, it's a little bit different. And that would be an independent agent. And that would, you know, keep you from not having a U.S. trade or businesses, which is what we want to avoid if we want to avoid U.S. taxation. Okay, I'm skipping back up to you, Richard. So, Mr. Johnson, I want to do business in trucking industry. I need to open a company in the U.S. and obtain an MC and DOT number. Um, can I open an LLC in Ohio and get an EIN number being a foreigner? So the answer, I can answer your question is yes, you can open an, an Ohio LLC and yes, you can get an EIN number. The EIN numbers are being really annoying right now. The IRS is supposed to take five to seven days, but they really just don't send it unless you call them a bunch of times. So the IRS is super annoying. Um, but yeah, you can definitely do that. I don't know about the MC and the dot number, but you can surely open an LLC and an EIN number. Um, I have a, a number of clients who are helping, who who are in the industry, but they don't actually have like the trucks. They, they're like servicing the truckers and they're providing remote services for truckers. Um, and there's a, I have other people who do recruiting for trucking companies. So there's a lot of there's a lot of different you know businesses in the trucking industry. Um, but I'm not really sure the MC and the dot number might be like actual business licenses, but um, that's if you're going to be doing business in the U.S., which is like owning trucks and then transporting them to and from, it might make sense to have a U.S. corporation instead of an LLC. If you have an LLC, then you're going to have to file. Mr. Johnson is going to have to file uh, tax returns in the U.S. and report his income and expenses and pay tax up to um, up to um, whatever, 37 percent. Uh, whereas if you have a corporation, you're going to pay up to 21%. And uh, yes, there is withholding taxes on dividend payments. But generally what we do is you have the independent trucking agency, which does its trucking work. And then you, another abroad person, maybe have another company and you pay yourself for services performed on that business to kind of reduce the actual taxable income from the trucking company. And this way you can keep it separated and really, and really benefit from um, being a non-resident. And while you have a U.S. trader business, uh, you you wouldn't you you would lower your income. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make us answer make a separate like blurb about that because we are like taking a lot of these snippets and repurposing them. Uh, so I'm gonna do that really quick right now. So here's here's a here's a here's a secret on how to have a U.S. trader business and still lower your taxes even more. How a foreign owned U.S. active business can pay less taxes and. Generally, I'm talking about if you have stores or if you have uh, a, a business that's physically going on in the U.S. Let's say let's say you have a shoe store. No, let's go with my old example. Let's say you have a canoe store. If you have a canoe store down by the river and you're selling canoes to people, generally you're going to use a, a C corporation just because you're going to have direct lines of what business paying tax where. If you're a foreign person and you want to run this business from abroad. You have a C corporation and then you pay tax in the U.S. with a C corporation on your profits. The trick is and the thing that we do is that you are actually working for the business, but you're doing it abroad. So what you'll do is you'll have your C corporation pay you for your marketing fees, pay you for your professional services and pay you for whatever you're doing, which will reduce the taxable income in the U.S. so that you're actually paying less taxes in the U.S. And it's a way for you to take the profits out of your company for the work that you're doing while still having a U.S. trader business. So if you have a U.S. trader business, you can still get around a lot of taxes in the U.S. just because of the entrepreneur friendly economy that we have and, and just the, the, the freedom and the control that the, the government and the institutions give you to report your own taxes and your own reports. And uh, there's the, you have the freedom to set everything up in, your, in the way that benefits you the most uh, and in a way that reflects the actual accurate facts. And there's, there's a lot of ways to do this to actually reduce your taxes. So. This is just like a spin off on the last question we got. So I wanted to just like make that its own little little post, its own little snippet. And I'm going to go back to some of these other questions. Because I think that's a really good one. You should definitely um, snip that one, Danny. 
Okay. Okay, let's do wands first. How do I determine if my LLC needs to file a U.S. tax return? And if so, which forms do I need to use? Great generic question, Juan. So if you have a U.S. LLC and you open it in the prior year, you probably need to file a tax return. There's three different, there's three primary ways in which you would file a tax return owning an LLC. If there's only one owner of an LLC and you paid to open the company in the prior year, we're talking January 1st to December 31st. If you paid to open the company in that period, then you will have to file a form 5472 to report what you paid in connection with the formation of the company by April 15th of the next year. So right now we're working on clients forms that are due on April 15th for the companies that we opened in the prior year in 2020. If there's more than one owner to the company, let's say Juan and his friend Roberto both own the company, then you, if you have income or expenses, which opening the company is generally expense, but if you have income and expenses, then you're required to file a form 1065 by March 15th, which is like next week. If you didn't do that yet, you you can request a a, a, a six month extension by filing form 7004-7004. And um, what's what's next? And then if you and if you have an LLC and you made a corporate tax election, which is pretty uh, like something that you actually have to go and do, then you have to file a corporate tax return. But you generally wouldn't do that on your own unless you like are really into this stuff and you should. If you do that, then you should know about your tax filings. So those are really the, uh, that's how you determine what tax returns you need to file and what forms you need to use. Um, are we doing Spanish live? Good point, uh, but lead to a call. Out. Um, if you have any questions about this stuff though, guys, you can definitely, I put my support email, you can definitely email us and get on a call with my team. We, we definitely have um, support members who I've been working with for, for over a year who know a lot about the nuances of this stuff, who can answer a lot of questions for free. And then also if you would need a private call with me, I do paid calls. I don't, I'm pretty busy. So like the schedule is not open that much, but we can set it up. Um, so that's definitely like my uh, little call to action while I'm on live. Um, I'm going to jump down to Master Pizop Arts. Hey, James, looking to start my LLC, and I'm concerned about the legal stuff. Nice. How do I know if I'm going to miss any important forms? Well, how do I know <laughs> what, what form the question comes down to? What do I need to know when registering an LLC? And how do I know if I'm missing anything? And this comes down to you don't know what you don't know. And that's a huge thing about working with professionals. If you are just don't have a business and you're just playing around online and you're just like, I want to open an LLC and try and get a bank account and see if I can like start making some money doing something and you're dabbling around, just you can watch my videos. You can ask me here. Um, generally, legally, uh, when you're when you register an LLC, if you use one of these companies, I don't know what they're doing with your data, but they generally don't need. A passport or anything they just need your name some address information they need you to pay uh and then you have to get the ein number the there's not a lot of legal things you need to worry about too much if you're just if you're not really doing anything it's more it's more if you're providing a lot of services or if you are um if you're working with a lot of clients or if you have a, a, another business abroad or if you have like U.S. contractors, like if you're the more stuff you're doing with your company, the more legal things you need to be aware of and the more ways you need to protect yourself. Um, a lot of what we advise our clients with is how to actually operate the entity, what you can and can't do. And if there's things that are kind of questionable or maybe in the U.S., I mean, questionable in terms of like uh, maybe create tax exposure, uh, we will advise on how to mitigate that risk. And yeah, ultimately, if you're concerned about legal stuff, you, you can pay someone to help you with it. That's what we do, obviously. But um, that's why I said it comes down to like where you're at. Um, if you're if you're making money and running a business and selling stuff, it's probably the best for you to pay someone who knows what they're doing and, and focus on selling more. That's what I tell my clients. But if you're just um, starting up and you're dabbling and you're like, I want to just try and get some clients and you don't know what's going on and you don't have a lot of money. Try it yourself. That's why I have this channel here to help uh, give information for you guys to help uh, help out with whatever questions you have. 
Um, so that's a good question. Great. When he, Jesus with the questions, thanks for being here, Jesus, keeping me, keeping me moving. Um, what information is submitted when opening an LLC? Uh, each of the states have their own version of the LLC. There's 50 states in the U.S. Most people are choosing Wyoming or Delaware or New Mexico or Florida. And generally, when you're opening an LLC, what you're depending on the state you're choosing depends on the information that's provided. If you open a Florida LLC, you have to say who the owner is and his address. Um, and you, but you generally don't need to share like a passport, a passport number or anything specific mm -hmm. that information you would have to share with banks. So you, you can open an LLC with pretty minimal information. You can also open, get an EIN number with, without too much identifiable information. The people that need the information are the actual institutions where you can do business, banks, payment processors, um, brokerage accounts you know, people holding and managing money on your behalf. So that's where you need to um, uh, give out passports, which are like the personally identifiable information. So the IRS only is going to see what you give them. They're only going to see initially the responsible party indicated on the EIN form. So the, I, the only thing you do with the IRS is the EIN, the employer identification number. So when you open a new company, you have the uh, registration with the state, and that's only with the state. They don't send that to the IRS yet. Coming soon, Corporate Transparency Act. Um, and then the IRS is only going to know your name as the re uh, as the responsible party. So the IRS doesn't know that much right away. When you go to the bank, they're going to know your information. And they potentially would share income information to the IRS, depending if you generated income from the account. If you don't they won't share anything and that's that's what's pretty cool about the us and mexico and in other countries the banks just share everything when money gets wired to you the the government knows in the us if if, if someone wires me a million dollars the irs wouldn't know the bank knows and the bank could tell the irs or they could tell fincen or they could tell any other government watchdog but it's not integrated where it's just they know everything automatically always so that's a big uh, a big difference and Annually, when you file tax returns with a single member LLC, you're supposed to give them your foreign tax number. It's a faxed form still. It's not being plugged into a database. So I and a lot of clients still don't provide it or provide the wrong number or whatever. So it's not really um, and it's not really an issue for most people. And then for the multi-member LLCs, if you don't have an ITIN, the IRS isn't going to know who you are because you just get you're putting foreign on the on the multi-member LLC form. Um, so if you're a Mexican resident, but you're a Venezuelan and you have Spanish citizenship. Yeah. So you basically put every, like if, you, so what I would do in your situation is if you live in a country and you have an LLC, just use uh, passports from other countries. So the information will never get back to the country you live in. It's a sweet, it's a sweet hack. It's a really great way to do it. And, um, Okay, uh, but that's that's a good that's a great question, um, and that's a great way to like uh, go through it. And you can't really it's hard to do too much with a Venezuelan passport with Spain for sure. It works great. <sighs> cool, Jesus. Good questions. Okay, we got DJ Arman Arizaga, Spain. Okay, example: a company's paying royalties to a foreign company. He's a DJ, so he's getting royalties. Okay. Okay, so how do royalties work for non-resident um, people getting paid royalties? And it comes down to what is a royalty, who's paying the royalty, and what tax information you're providing. So a royalty is generally, and I'm not going to look up the definition, but if you have a music and someone's paying you to use it, it's a royalty. If you have a, if you write a book and Amazon's selling the book, you're the 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 book for you on Amazon um kindle or whatever they they consider that a royalty because it's your they're selling the rights to use your stuff so they're going to charge generally the flat rates of 30 percent withholding tax on royalties to u.s source uh, to u.s sources so if you're selling if you have if you're a dj and you and you're licensing your music only 
typically only the U.S. source revenues, which is like the, the money generated from U.S. listeners, is going to be subject to tax and subject to the tax withholding. YouTube is similar. YouTube, if you're making money on a YouTube channel as a foreign person, only on your U.S. source ad revenue, ads generated on viewers from in the U.S. is going to be subject to withholding. And for some reason, they withhold like 26 or 24 percent. So this withholding is flat and there's no like way to get it back. Uh, it's 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 what you're due. If you shouldn't be paying this with withholding, you have to file a W-8 B-E-N or B-E-N-E, depending on how you have it set up and, and take a treaty position. Potentially, if you're a foreign person, you're making a lot of money with withholdings and you don't want to do like a U.S. Corp or something, you could open a, what do they do, like a, a Seychelles company? No, one of the one of these the offshore jurisdictions has a treaty with the U.S. and the, and the royalty rate is 0%. Um, I have to double check. It's obviously there's a lot of compliance costs associated with that and then local income tax laws, but it's lower than 30%. So um, there's options like that. There's always... In, in, in summary here, uh, wh while there's a lot of problems all the time, there's always solutions that, that are going to come up. And um, there's always, uh, there's the, we can always find a solution. But if you want to, um, if you want us to help you find a solution, you know, send us an email, schedule a call or do something like that because um, we have a lot of information that should be put, posted up on here. Oh, well, if you live in the U.S., then you sh they shouldn't withhold taxes. Uh, if they don't have an ITIN number. So, yeah, well, if you're a U.S. person and you indicate you're a U.S. person, no one's going to withhold taxes on your payments because it's your responsibility to pay your own taxes. Um, MD2. If I have a business in the event industry under an LLC, but I'm doing 100% of our events in Canada and outside the U.S., where would I be paying taxes? Great question. Where do I pay taxes is the question. In this, in this example, you have 100% of your business in Canada and outside the U.S., you pay taxes where you're doing the events. It's very simple. If you're throwing an event in Canada and, you, and you're selling tickets to an event, you pay tax in Canada. Uh, it, it, and I don't know the laws in these countries, but I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you with pretty good with pretty high level of certainty that if you are throwing events in in the UK or in Slovakia or wherever the heck you're doing your events, you're gonna pay tax where you're throwing the event. In in, in the in the in the grand scheme of all this tax stuff, you, you're paying taxes where you're doing business. And um, if you're throwing an event somewhere, you're clearly doing business there. So that's a, a good, a nice, a nice, easy question for me. Um, and if you have questions about it, let me know. I'm happy to go into more detail with you or refer you to someone. But it's, uh, it's you wouldn't pay taxes in the U.S. unless you're a U.S. resident or owner. Okay, so... More, give me more, Mr. Armand. You have, um, you're paying for it. What are you paying them for? Because I have to go soon, guys. I have to get back to doing taxes. I hope my clients are seeing me on here asking me where their tax returns are. Why am I doing lives when I should be doing, <laughs> doing tax returns? Um, I want to answer some questions. I haven't done these in a while. And I'm probably going to skip the Spanish channel today. I would love to do it in Spanish, but I'm pretty beat. Um, see you, Juan. Uh, more CTAs. Okay. You're, okay. Okay. Um, email, just email us and we can send you the link. I don't have it. Uh, maybe I do have it here. Uh, so you're paying royalties to foreign people. That's annoying. Um, it's, it's really nuanced because it's like you have to, I mean, technically you're supposed to be withholding taxes on the royalties. You pay. I don't know the numbers. Like if it's not high numbers, I would probably not do it. Honestly. Oh, cool. Cool banner. If you're not paying a lot, I probably wouldn't do it. But if you're paying large amounts, you definitely are responsible for it. Uh, just the cost of compliance for lower numbers isn't worth it. But the cost of um, not doing it's higher if you, if you are supposed to do it. So yeah. Um,
yeah, I don't even have times until next week. Uh, and then I'm traveling. Yeah, I don't have much time in the next two weeks, but it's okay. Um, we can get through it. Okay, everyone. I've been answering a ton of questions. I've been on here for over an hour. I definitely have to get going. Any other any other questions? Any other things that you got before I go? We are you are doing the withholding, so you need to be doing the 1042s, the 1042s, and the 1042ts. Um, yes, for your clients. Bye, guys. I appreciate you all being here. Thanks for liking, subscribing to the channel and everything. Um, no more questions. I am going to sign off. I'm so sorry for my Spanish fans who uh, have the questions in Spanish. You've been waiting. If you if you have them, I'll answer them on here. But I'm too I'm too beat to go do the uh, another hour on a Spanish channel. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Got it. Okay, so schedule a call if you have questions. Happy to help. Hope this was informational and useful for you all. And I appreciate my team who uh, helps me make these videos uh, repurpose, so you can all watch them later. <laughs> Okay, I am out of here. Got it. Bye, everyone.